I would say that the grand theory of evolution is a mixture of science and philosophy. And the philosophy is more dominant nowadays than the science. Science is used to back up the philosophy and naturalism. What I find is that most people, most evolutionists, have never critically examined their own position. It's such a sacred cow, even in their own minds, it's unthinkable to start examining the weaknesses. It's an amazing stronghold. And so I guess I'm trying to suggest why the de creation evolution debate isn't uh, the sort of logical argument that you'll get among scientists when they're discussing, say, the role of sunlight in triggering flowering. But with the creation evolution issue, uh, if evolution is not true, then it means we're created. And if biblical creation is true, then it means it's the God of the Bible to whom we are accountable to. And that, for many people, is a no-go zone. You know, if you want to consider yourself part of the intellectual elite, you must be a Darwinist. It's that simple. It's like, it's like um, the fee you pay to get into the club. And so this is a very, very strong motivator. And there's a flip side to that, which is if you don't hold it, you are, will be ridiculed and treat it as if you're really stupid and really ignorant. And so the fear of ridicule is just palpable on campuses. There are many, many scientists who actually realize they, that there are major problems with Darwinian theory, but they are silent because they know if they speak their doubts, they will get in trouble. They won't get grants, they won't get funding, they won't be politically correct, they won't have friends. All the, all the stuff that makes for academic success goes away if you question Darwin. So, if evolution is true, many honest evolutionists acknowledge there is no rational basis for morality. It opens up the prospect of um, all sorts of things like uh, what, what really is ultimately wrong with abortion. Um, I mean, after all, if you've uh, got an unwanted pregnancy, why not terminate it? What does it really matter, ultimately? Um, what if someone is old and unproductive? Uh, they're, they're a burden on society. Society has to support them, feed them, care for them. Uh, why not just help them along the way, get rid of them, you know? Now, there's some moral implications there. If the Creator made us, then He owns us and has a right to make the rules for us. But if we things made themselves, then there's no right or wrong. We're just really bags of rearranged pond scum. So what is murder? It's just one bag of chemicals impacting another bag of chemicals. Science can't tell you that murder is right or wrong. It can tell you that this action will kill something. It won't tell you that it's right or wrong. This issue of evolution affects so many things in people's lives. It affects the way they feel about themselves. It affects the way people treat one another. It affects their attitude to uh, motivation for living. It affects the way, the way they regard law in their country. It affects the value that they place on other human beings. Now, many critics of Christianity point to various religious wars, the Crusades, the Inquisitions. Now, first of all, uh, these people were acting inconsistently with the teachings of Christ. Second, the numbers are minuscule compared to the atrocities committed by atheist regimes in the 20th century. Now, evolution has been used as a basis for society, and that society was the society of Nazi Germany. Now, Hitler was definitely trying to put Darwin's ideas into practice, like the idea of survival of the fittest, which means death of the unfit. Hitler believed that some races were more highly evolved than others, but the Jewish race was uh, subhuman, he believed. And so if we take the ideas of evolution, we attempt to apply them to ourselves, uh, the result is not pretty. It's hideous. Uh, it's evil. Now, I'm actually Jewish ethnically, and of course, my people were almost wiped out in Europe. Six million of us were butchered by this evolutionary philosophy. 
and handicapped people were thought of as being less than human. Um, Hitler's own propaganda films said, we have sinned grievously against the law of natural selection by allowing the handicapped people to live. Menschen haben gegen dieses Gesetz der natürlichen Auslese in den letzten Jahrzehnten furchtbar gesündigt. Wir haben unwertes Leben nicht nur erhalten, wir haben ihm auch Vermehrung gewährt. Die Nachkommen dieser Kranken sahen so aus, in denen tausende lallende Schwachsinnige künstlich ernährt und gepflegt werden müssen, die tiefer stehen als jedes Tier. So Hitler replaced the Judeo-Christian ethic of sanctity of innocent life made in God's image with an evolutionary ethic uh, that whatever's good for the evolution of the master race is good for society. After the war, the leading Nazis were put on trial. But some of them claimed they did nothing wrong because the laws of our country said it was okay to kill Jews. So on what grounds can you put them on trial? Only if there's a higher morality than national law. But where can this morality come from if not from the creator of humanity? If we just rearrange pond scum, there's no such thing as a higher law. Mankind is capable of doing all sorts of evil against other men. And to think that we might have kind of gotten this out of our system or that we're uh, structured our societies in ways that this can't happen again is naive. If powerful people take on ideas that are poisonous, the result is the death of people. The last century was the most bloodstained in all of human history. And this was not due to religious wars, some people like to point to. It was at the hand of genocidal, mass-murdering governments led by men like Hitler and Stalin and, and Chairman Mao and Pol Pot. Now, all of these regimes had one thing in common, and that was a devout belief in evolution. This caused them to view people as nothing more than animals to be culled. I mean, Mao regarded himself as a disciple of Darwin. Hitler even wrote that struggle is the father of all things. He who does not want to fight in this world where eternal struggle is, is the law of life has no right to exist. Now, a lot of people say this is maybe stretching things too far, but what if you were one of the ones consigned to the gulags or the gas chambers or the firing squads? and you also believed in evolution, what basis would you have for saying that they were wrong or acting inconsistently for what both of you believe? But have we really learned from history? Because the same philosophy behind Nazi Germany, which is evolution, is now being mandated in the government schools across the nations in the Western world. So should we be surprised that some of the consequences will also follow? Already we're having leading philosophers and so-called bioethicists talking about killing babies after birth if they're not fit enough. It's difficult to anticipate what any one society would do if it fully adopted an evolutionary view. Because if you try and derive morality from the animal kingdom, for example, there are all sorts of moralities that you might choose. Because when we look to the natural world to define a morality statement, what we find is that all sorts of different animals make their way in the world by doing all sorts of different things. While there's beauty in nature, there's also horror. I mean, as Tennyson wrote, it is red in tooth and claw. Darwin realized this, and that, that seems to be behind his rejection of a belief in an altruistic God in heaven. But it's not only in the natural world we see these horrors, there are also human-inflicted terrors that can be even on a mass scale. So seeing these two types of evil should cause a revulsion in people. The reality is, it should cause us to stop and realize that something is actually wrong. It shouldn't be like this. No one is really reconciled with death. Yet evolution says it is all perfectly normal. One of the biggest problems people have with the God of the Bible is that if there's a God of love, how come there's so much death and suffering in the world? Now, the Bible explains this because death and suffering in the Bible is a result of man's rebellion against their creator.
But evolution says that death and suffering are a natural part of what produced man in the first place. So evolution provides no comfort for those who are, who are suffering because suffering, sorry, is part of life. It's part of a struggle for existence. There's another reason why uh, an evolutionist will hold on to their belief system even when all the fatal flaws are revealed. And that is because if evolution isn't true, it strongly points them in a different direction. Because really, if the universe and life didn't self-create, if it didn't happen spontaneously, then there has to be a creator. And the creator is not likely to be some little green man from another galaxy. The creator is going to be Almighty God. And so if God is truth, I'm going to try and orient my life in ways that conform with that. Whether that's the way I treat my wife and my children as a father and as a husband, uh, whether that's the way I treat my old age and evolutionary colleagues with the utmost of respect because I believe that they are people that are made in the image of God. They're no different from me. They're no different from anyone else that I know. And when we start off with that idea that God made all people and that he cares for all people, if we let that sit in our hearts for a little while, it really affects the way that we treat everyone we come in contact with. Salvation doesn't result from intellectual activity. It doesn't come about through figuring out God or theology. Uh, it is a spiritual transaction. So for me, when I understood that God made a perfect creation, there was a literal fall, and that now God is uh, restoring us by the sacrifice of his son, it really transformed my faith. For although I was a Christian for 10 years, I was a incredibly weak Christian. And so every aspect of my faith was transformed by more fully submitting to God and believing his word.